Today we begin a series of four messages preparing us for the year. Today's message is titled, A Fresh Start, and we'll deal with the four things that will condition what we do this year. Starting, struggling, staying with it, and succeeding. Our text this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. We turn to God's Word. Seventy percent of all the decisions that are made in the Billy Graham ministry in the Crusades are those who have been brought to the Crusade or given a ride to the Crusade. That tells us something about the influence that we have that speaker and event and church and program cannot provide. Let's look this year at our friends and associates that we can properly gracefully, lovingly, and firmly persuade to consider Jesus Christ and God's house. You'd be surprised how many people are waiting for a personal invitation. Even to strangers, sometimes it's easier because they know about our church or they know about the ministry here, and it's very, very easy to invite them. Sometimes we become a little more tentative with our friends because we think if we introduce them to Christ or, or in one way or another try to influence them, we'll lose their friendship. Not so. God is working in the hearts of everybody. He is the original convincer. He convinces the world of that which is wrong, that which is inevitable, and that which will be a consequence. So he's already doing the advance work. He already is softening the hearts of people. And the only answers to the riddle of life can be found through Jesus Christ and His Word. So you are robbing your friends and associates from the blessing, from a favor. You're doing them a favor by telling them about the Lord in your congregation. So let's invite friends. Don't wait for an ad in the paper or an event to do that. You have strategic opportunities to invite people to Calvary Church. Eighty percent of the people that make decisions for Christ and be involved in a local congregation have been made because of the influence of a friend or associate. So it doesn't happen here. It happens right there. The power of the church is not in the pulpit, it's in the pew. We provide the services and the ministry and the teaching, but you do the work. And I hope that you'll see how important you are as a leader, not just as a follower of the Lord in this congregation. Our reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And I want one phrase to remain with you, especially today and uh, throughout this coming year. I'd like you to read with me Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Will you do that? Let's begin reading. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. A fresh start. The title might be Looking to Jesus. Now let's take this passage apart. We want to primarily keep that theme and that idea and that topic in our minds looking to Jesus. Now this setting of these verses come after a great climax, a catalog, a hall of fame, a listing of those primarily prominent believers who had faith in God. And chapter 11 begins that. It defines faith as the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen the biblical definition of faith. And then it lists by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And all of 11 is a catalog of these people. Many of them you know, many of them are kind of bunched together. And their biography and their story isn't told. But the whole preceding message before he gets to this word wherefore, 
which is like turning the page to the next chapter or this is what this means or wake up this is for you or this is an application time not just an information time he lists these men and when we look at this chronology and when we look at this college of spiritual and biblical graduates I must admit that I feel less than I think of Noah I think of Abraham and we call them giants in the faith but that's not the purpose of listing these people so that we see these as primary examples of excellence and then the rest of us are spectators or we're watchers we're workers but we're not in the same league we're not in the same class that's not the purpose of chapter 11 to make me feel insecure or less than the purpose of that chapter of all these people is to show you that that's what they did now it's your chance and that's the meaning of this first phrase if you look at it wherefore seeing we also are encompassed about by a great cloud of witnesses these aren't fans these people that are looking down on us they're not spectators as if they're just watching another performance they are connected to us or better said we're connected to them they're almost like the markers they're like those who did it they are past competitors they've also played the game and this is the way they played it they played it by faith when situations were complex where things were contradictory where they suffered in silence and no one gave them a real answer to their problems when they didn't really come up with anything to show for themselves as a result of what they did when they followed God in the dark whistling and sometimes not even passing air without making a note this is what they did now they've gone before now it's our chance this is what they did and this is what we're supposed to do and we're supposed to do it exactly as they did it and we are surrounded by these witnesses these witnesses and the word for witness originally was martyr we are surrounded by these who were our examples these who were just like us and their witness their testimony their experience their background what they brought to the scene is impetus it's it's a strengthening factor it's fuel to keep us going it's not that they're looking down from heaven nobody in heaven is aware of what is going on on earth there's not a line in the scripture that suggests that because if they would look down they would be overcome by the contrast I have not seen nor ear heard nor has it even been imagined even with the glimpse that is in the Bible what heaven is like it would be just gross for them to see in such a stark contrast for the glorious witness of heaven and all of its all of its reigning glory to look down upon this cinder pad upon which people are failing and sin is becoming more intense the purpose of mentioning these is in the light of the past passage that they are markers for us they've set the pace they've done it and then as the passage goes along it tells us that we are to look unto Jesus who also did it he also is a martyr he also is a marker he also provides us with the mandate as to how we are to do it so when we come to this passage it's very practical it's very poignant it's personal seeing that this has taken place and that's been an example for us and we're to look unto Jesus now here's where we're supposed to start this is what we are supposed to do look at the passage we are to lay aside every weight as I study this passage and the book of Hebrews is a very favorite book of mine even in seminary I wrote extended outlines on this book it's one of the most difficult books in the New Testament it quotes more from the Old Testament than any other book and that's why New Testament Christians don't read the book because the book was originally written to Jews that they would stop thinking about jewelry about Israel about Moses about angels about the imaginations of their old system and to come to Jesus 
Laying aside the first principles, they needed to move on to the Lord. Moses was great, but Jesus is better, and so on. And the book is to prove the excellence of Christ above everything, that Jesus is better. So let's move on now. And uh, it was as if the Jewish believers in the first century were stuck on first base. And he wanted them to go to second, third, and home and look unto Jesus instead of all the things in the past. So that's the background, and that's why a lot of believers don't read this book. But it's magnificent. It's so rich and deep. Let us lay aside every weight. He always uses the word us. Let us. Let us. It's not a personal pronoun, as it is with Paul. This is what I did. This is what you need to do. The book is corporate. It's congregational. It's collective. It's church. It's body. It's us. Not this is what they did and this is what I suppose I'll do. It's like they did that, we do this, but we're in it together. Let us lay aside every weight. As I thought about that, I said, why doesn't the line go looking unto Jesus and then you get that motivation and that excitement. You can start again, you keep your eyes on the Lord, and then, and then you can lay aside every weight. But it doesn't work that way. With every decision, there has to be the determination to do what is right to do, even before the impetus is offered or the reward is promised. You cannot live your life by rewards. You cannot live your life by that kind of motivation of promise. Decision-making is deeper. It doesn't lie in what I get from it. It lies in why it is to be done, and I'm going to do it. You do first, and then you get the feeling to do it. That's the way it is with any decision. If you wait for the feeling to do what you ought to do, it'll never come, because Feelings come and go, and our emotions vacillate. They go up and down. Decision-making is in the will, not in the feel. Decision-making isn't even in the mind, because the mind will adjust and accommodate and rationalize and change. God calls us to make the decision in our will. If any man will, let him take up his cross and follow me. You deny yourself then you take up the cross. You count the cost, then you build the tower. It involves the will, and that deals with anything in life. Dieting, financing, aerobics, discipline, more reading, more leisure time. It involves everything in life. It has to begin in the will. And when you say, I will, I will, I will, that was the theme of the prodigal son. He was not only in need, he was not only stuck. He could have lived there and maybe come out of the pig pen and worked. Times would have changed. Famines come and go. But he says to himself, I will arise and I will go to my father. And I will say to my father, Father, I have sinned against heaven. And three times he says, I will, I will, I will. And that's what you and I need to say this year. Not I plan to do it or it's on my schedule, or I hope to get to it. But this year, I'm going to lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets. And weight and sin are two different things. The weight is some kind of handicap, some kind of obstacle, some kind of limitation. Now, this is where I want you to do the preaching and the thinking. It doesn't say what the weight is. It doesn't help you. At this point, if you're studying and teaching and applying and listening as you are this morning so intentively, you have to ask the Lord, if you're in fellowship with Him, what that means. If you're not in fellowship, what I'm going to say now is really going to irritate you. All of us know that we have so much to do with so little time. All of us know that we want to make a fresh start this year. All right? Now you think just for a minute. I'll stop talking for a couple of seconds. What is holding you down? What's the weight? What's the limitation? What's the handicap? When you say handicap, you almost make an allowance. In golf, a handicap makes you feel not quite like those who don't need a handicap, but it, it accommodates, it gives you a little adjustment, it gives you space. 
The word handicap came originally 175 years ago. It was developed in the English language. It was part of a lottery system. And when you were penalized in the lottery, you had to put your hand in your cap and you had to work with one hand. So the handicap was a penalty. The word here isn't handicap, but the weight appears only one time in all of the Bible. This strange word, the weight. And it means limitation, something that holds you back, something that, that impedes the progress and doesn't give you that flair to move on. Sin, you know, is a handicap. Sin prevents you from reaching a goal. Sin is a limiter. Sin is a handicap. And most of our handicaps are self-imposed. Most of our sins are deliberate. We like to think that because we're sinners in Adam, that this is just to be accepted. This is what comes naturally. This is what's going to happen. And so the Christian life is some compensation against some, some problem that can never be dealt with. That's not the Christian experience. That's why I spent a couple of minutes comparing you and me with these giants in chapter 11. There's no allowance here. They're no better than you are. Now, they didn't have any more advantage that, that you might see you have at this point. They're all like. And when you think of the Lord Jesus, he was like too. Don't ever think that because the Lord Jesus was God, he had some edge. And when it came to be a temptation time and a trial time, when he was out of food and water and he was languishing and Satan was beating up on him, that there was some kind of secret little, little energy box that he drew from so that this temptation was just really uh, some kind of mirage. It wasn't a real temptation. Don't ever believe that. Our Lord Jesus was victor over the Satan temptation times because of his humanity, not because of his divinity. There's no interplay there. Each is separate, and yet it's one. He was tempted in all points, I'm so grateful for this line, like as we are tempted, but becomes the captain of salvation through the things that we suffered. What I'm trying to say to Ross Rhodes is, you do not have a right to feel sorry for yourself. You do not have a right to think that others have it better, they have more talent, they have more opportunity, they have more money, they have better health or whatever. You can't say that. This is us. This is we. We're all in it together, seeing that they've set the mark and they've done what they have done by faith. Then each of us, each of us needs to lay aside that weight and that sin that so easily besets. I was talking with a man this week who is a specialist in the field. And he said, most people, most people don't go on and don't have the burst to make a difference in the starting of a new year because they keep thinking about the past. The Bible doesn't say ever to look to the past. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. And a lot of us take comfort in that we're not succeeding. We kind of justify our failure because we look back at what happened. Don't we? Kind of feels good to say this or that about what happened in our lives. And it, it, it makes us live with greater laziness. It justifies our inactivity but it never condones our disobedience. The weight, what is the weight? Your reflection on your past? What happened to you? What, what you didn't have uh, that others had in life? Don't look to the past. And many people look to the future. And they say, well, it's going to get better. They wait for some kind of circumstance to tumble in to turn things around. God never tells you other than looking for the coming of Jesus Christ to make any investment, I don't mean financial, into hopes and promises that are unrealistic apart from the return of Jesus Christ. Give us this day our daily bread. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Don't say tomorrow we'll do such and such a thing from the book of James. For nobody knows what a day will bring forth. 
God gives you a day, one day, this day. What you decided yesterday is what you are today. And what you will be tomorrow will be determined by what you do today. What are you looking to? The past? The future? Lay aside the weight. Maybe the weight really is not what I've suggested. And that's peripheral teaching at this point. Let's get to the heart of it. Maybe it's the sin factor. Laying aside any weight and the sin that makes you a handicap and puts your fist in the hat so that you're living and operating with one hand behind your back. What is it in your life that you need to surrender to the Lord? You know, when you think about this, would you think about this for a minute? It's not that the Lord is asking you to make a sacrifice. It's not that the Lord says, all right, now you're going to have to give this up, and I'm telling you, it's going to be hard, so grit your teeth and uh, get ready. It's uphill battle. This isn't the teaching of this passage. This is not what the Lord is saying to us this morning. The Lord is saying you shouldn't have a handicap. Why are you living with that kind of penalty? Get your hand out of the hat. Put your hand to the plow. Don't look back. Sin is a spoiler of success. Sin limits you. Sin is an obstacle. It prevents you from going on. It's damaging. It destroys. It denies you the opportunity to succeed. Give it up. Why not? Drop it. Run. And this whole context, of course, is in the context of competition. Paul uses this theme in Corinthians 9 when he speaks about the stadium and all of us running, 1 Corinthians 9, 22. And this is the context here. It's not quite, don't believe for a minute that these saints are looking down and watching the game. That's not the point, because many of the Greek games were not run in competition. When Paul says, I run to receive the prize, it's not saying he's pushing all the other Christians out of the way and he's some kind of Budinsky and he wants to win. Many of the Greek games were run singly. And many of them, as you know, in the original, the runner ran almost naked. Anything that you're holding on to, any extra garment, get down to the basic minimum. Don't look behind you. He that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit to the kingdom, Jesus said. Don't look at the competition. Don't look at other people. They'll, you know, they'll distract you. They, 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 may, they may really try to trip you. You keep your eye on the race. It's set before, so you, you, you drop whatever it is that is going to cause you to lose. What is that? What is it that you're doing that makes you weak? What is it that causes the spiritual fire and feeling of a morning like this to evaporate? What is it that you can detect and you can feel it, you know it, and it's instantly in your heart right now that is your limiter? What is it? Get rid of it. The word lay aside means drop it, throw it. Hank was dealing with some notes in the room before we had prayer, and uh, we were about ready to go out, and we started to pray, and he took whatever he had in hand, and he threw it into the basket. I mean, it was a super dunk. He was close. It wasn't a gift on his part, but he, it made a noise in the trash can in the little room. And I thought when he did that, that's exactly what this text is saying. Not just lay it aside. The English is weak here. It means throw it. You're just about to go around the second lap. You're running, and you realize, hey, I don't need this. This is slowing me down. Vroom! You drop it. You cast it. Throw it away. And it gives you a new burst of energy, new possibility for success, and winning the prize. And Jesus is at the line, looking unto Jesus. Are you willing to do that? Most people think that preachers ought to beg, shame, scold, blame, beat up the sheep when it comes to sin. We ought to say to believers and non-believers, listen, 
You ought to leave your sin for your sake, let alone for your family's sake and for God's sake. And that's what the Lord Jesus does. He forgives our sins. He wants to take your sins. He wants to take that thing which you allow. It becomes an excuse. It's ruining your Christian life. It's weakening your resolve. It takes the glow away from worship. It's nasty. It's wicked. It's an abomination, God says. Words like it limits you and it's an obstacle are too passive. Your sin is an offense to God. Give it up. Throw it down. Drop it and run the race that's set before you. Let us lay aside, throw down every weight and the sin. Can't lay all of them down because some of them are part of your nature. But what you do deliberately and what you do repetitively and what you allow thinking that God may be looking the other way and he's going to give you some space. The sin for which there's no excuse and for which you are convicted. Deny it. Cast it off. Give it up for your sake. And realize that you're shaming God and spoiling your soul and endangering your fellowship with an eternal and living God. Let us lay aside and the sin that so easily trips us up. And look at the next line. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The word uh, with patience is the word that means endurance. It means to hold on. If you've ever done anything in sports or anything that is an effort, you come to the point where you say, I can't, I can't do this much longer. I was carrying some packages in and helping Carol from the store the other day, and the one bag was a little heavy, and I said to myself, I can't hold on this much longer. Either the bag's going to rip or my hand's going to give up. And the package is going to drop. I put my other arm around it and secured it. But I could feel that pain coming. I felt that in basketball and football. I felt that when I boxed. A point where you say, that hurts. I don't know how long I'm going to be able to hold on. That's the meaning of this word. It doesn't mean kind of patience. I've got a lot of patience. I'll hang around here. It means the ability to hold on when the pain is beyond the normal point. And your body says, whoa, I don't know about this. I didn't plan on this. And this is what the text is saying. Run with endurance. Don't give up. Don't give in. And why? Because the same strength and empowering work that Christ has given to you, he's given to others, and God has given to the saints of the past. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. A thought here, then we'll move on. I'd like you to see this whole picture. Would you look at that line, the race that is set before us? This is the whole picture. Not just the immediate or the short term, but the whole picture. I played golf a couple of times in the last month, and one course was very, very, very demanding. And when I was playing with this man, we took five or six minutes. I wanted to get going. I love golf, but it takes so much time. And when you make four or five real mistakes, double bogey and stuff, you very seldom can ever get back to anything decent. In tennis, I love tennis because you lose one, go on to another one. That was a bad shot, but there's another ball coming. And, you know, you can deal with failure, but, but golf, if you start going down, you really go down. Then you think of cheating and things like that. <laughs> Winner rules, bad lie. 
So this man, and he was treating me, it was a very, very unusual experience, quite expensive, and, but he wanted to treat me to this experience. We spent five or six minutes looking at the whole course on this little card. And then when we'd get to each hole, it was almost like I was taking lessons. He'd say, all right, now look here. There's a rough on the left, and it's high. See those trees? You don't want to go there. And on the right, it's nice and flat, but there's a little wall, and then there are three or four nice little traps. And the throat of the hole is right down the middle. So go right down the middle. If you fade a little to the right, notice how the green slopes. You're going to go right down on the other side of that wall. So there's the course. There's the hole. Tee up. Keep your eye on the flag. This is the meaning of this word. See the whole course. See the particular tee shot. Analyze the obstacles. Take a look at it. See the whole thing. And I think as Christians, we need to do that too. Let's take a look at the whole year. Let's take a look even beyond that. Let's take, of course, we must bring into our time factor at this point as we make our schedules and, and, and plan our year ahead. Let's remember the fact that the Lord Jesus may come and interrupt it all. But let's plan that he's not coming and work as hard as we can so that we don't slack off and treat it in an idyllic way. But remember that the whole course is concluded and the whole course has been laid out by him. What a great truth. Some courses laid out by Nicholas. Some courses Arnold Palmer. You see, the Lord Jesus laid out this course, and other people have played the course. And this is what they've done on hole five. This is what they did with the sand trap on hole seven. And then Jesus says, and I did the course. I played the same course. I had the same stuff going for me. I faced the same obstacles as you did. Now, seeing that you have these people that set the mark, and seeing since I did the course too, then you drop anything that impedes you, any obstacle, do away with any sin, because it's going to spoil your, your score. Look at the whole course, the race that's set before you. Measure your pace. Don't burn out too soon. Don't look back. Keep your eye on the course, and let's go. Lay aside any weight in sin. Run with endurance. You're going to play 18 today. We may even go 36. So take a look at the whole thing. This is what we're going to do. This is how long we're going to do it. And here's the course. Christians are great short term, but long term, because every day we have to realize that we will face him with our scorecard and we will give an account. This is Bible. We will give an account of ourselves to God. I'm telling you, that scares me most days. Give an account of every idle thought. Every word I will talk to the Lord God about. Look unto Jesus. I want you to look unto Jesus. Just, just listen now for a couple more minutes. I'm closing in at least five or six areas. And this is from Hebrews. Look unto Jesus. Here's how you're to look unto Jesus. This is the Jesus you're to look unto. You may have a Jesus of, of Holman's head of Christ. You may have a Jesus of a New Testament view. You may have a Jesus, whatever. Whatever your impression is of Jesus, listen to what the scripture says the Jesus is like that you're to look unto. You're to look unto Jesus as your priest. We did that at communion the other night. He's your priest. He died for the sins that you so sillyly hold on to. He died for the fact that even though you don't score high as he expects you to on the course, and don't use that as a cop-out, you will be in heaven just the same. He is a priest. He covers all your mistakes. He tears up your scorecard. It's almost as if you did it perfectly, even though you're shafting, even though you're putting three. The Lord Jesus is your priest. So don't deal any more with guilt. You're forgiven. He's forgotten your flaws. You're finally and eternally saved because of Jesus.
Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Look unto Jesus as your prophet. Look unto Jesus as your prophet. A prophet sees ahead and interprets what's coming. Look to Jesus now as the one who knows the whole course. He's called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He sees the whole view, and he'll give you a running commentary on every hole or every set. He knows it all. That's great comfort in 1995. Whatever is ahead, Jesus has already checked it off. Nothing will happen to you that he did not approve or initiate. Look unto Jesus, your prophet. Look unto Jesus as your preacher. I have no greater joy in life. Carol and I have no greater joy in life, 3 John 4, than our children walk in truth. That's a Bible verse. I have no greater joy in life than being married to a wonderful godly woman who is my comfort and my strength my friend and my partner. I have no greater joy in life than that. In terms of my career or my responsibility or my role, I have no greater joy in life than being the pastor of this congregation and a preacher of the Word of God. But my greatest joy in life ought to be that Jesus Christ is my preacher. He is the Word as well as the truth. Let Jesus Christ this year preach and teach Himself to you. Thirdly, Jesus Christ is precious. He is my preciousness. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 3. To those who are saved, He is precious. Precious. And the word precious means of great inestimable worth. Something to which there's no comparison. As I run this race, the most valuable coach, the person who has done it, my great confidant, the support for all that I do comes from the Lord Jesus. I want to tell you, he's rare, he's precious. He's the most valuable thing to me in life. When the martyrs had to confess that Jesus was their Lord and were burned at the stake, Fox's Book of Martyrs says that the thing that they feared most if they denied Jesus was that they would lose Jesus. He is precious. Looking unto Jesus, who is my prince? He is called the Prince of Peace. And the word prince here is larger. In Hebrews, he's called the Prince of the Kings of all the earth. Here, when you think of Jesus as prince, think of him as rulers. He's called the Prince of Righteousness. He's called the Prince of Life. He's the ruler. Listen, he's the sovereign. He's the God-man who is enthroned in heaven. You look unto Jesus as your prince. Looking unto Jesus who is your purifier. I'm through. Malachi chapter 3. The picture is of a man who in a little cauldron is putting hot fire under a pot. And in this pot is ore. And as the fire gets hotter, the impurities from the ore come to the top. He has a little skimmer, like a little uh, ladle in soup, and he skims off this junk. It kind of shines and comes to the surface, and he throws it off. And the Bible, listen carefully, this is so powerful, not that I'm saying it, but it's a powerful picture of Jesus. Is he not the one who sits by the refiner's fire? For he is the refiner. And the refiner's attitude is focused. I remember as a child, we had uh, 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 Batman, Spider-Man, 
Elastic Man, Superman comics. And when Superman was a comic, when he would see x-rays, there would be shafts of kind of white ink that would go right through a wall. When the Lord Jesus is looking at the refiner's fire, the scripture says he's looking right at it, intense focus. His attitude is to keep the fire at the right heat so that the dross comes to the top and that gunk can be lifted off. And then he sees at the right moment, for it's timely, his attitude and his timeliness must be right so that then he turns down the fire and takes that molten ore or gold or silver and he pours it into little molds to make jewelry or whatever to bring the implementation, the usefulness from this stuff. Is not Jesus like a refiner's fire? Malachi says, He is my purifier. So the Lord wants to purify us today. He wants to take away that gunk, that nasty stuff that surfaces to the top that He can slop over onto the ground. He wants to make us pure and fine. And in biblical language, listen, for those of you that are at that level, it's called sanctification. The purifying power of Christ in His risen life within you that takes away that gunk, thy dross to consume, thy gold to refine. And in Handel's Messiah, the choir goes crazy with these notes. Is he night not like the refiner's fire? And he keeps saying that. And they keep doing that. And the music becomes almost frenzied. He is the refiner's fire. And so it will be in the end time. He will come as the refiner. He will put all the nations in his cauldron. He'll turn up the heat. He'll come with feet of fire, John says in the book of Revelation. John says... He baptizes with fire. I baptize with water. So the Lord Jesus is my purifier. He turns up the heat. But why? So that all of the impurity and the pollutants, all the things that are extras, listen, the weight and the sin, all of that can be taken away. And I can be like gold and silver. I can be a metal in which you can see your face. I can be an emblem and a reflection of the Lord Jesus, who is the pearl of great price. Child of God, look unto Jesus. Look unto Jesus. But before you look unto Jesus in this glorious, glorious vision in the start of this year, you drop that weight. You surrender. Nothing to it, pal. Drop it. That's sin. You would have thought that the sermon would have begun, look unto Jesus, then do this. No, 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 no. That's too easy. The motivation comes from your determination. You drop that stuff, then you can look unto Jesus. If you come with that stuff to Jesus, you'll think you can keep it, and you can't. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. O oh, rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. I think that's enough. Let's pray. Father, for this magnificent congregation of your people, that for almost six decades you have drawn to favor and blessing. For all that has gone before, O oh Lord, for saints who started and now are seated in their place in heaven because of your grace, for all the witness and the work of thousands of people to this new year, 1995, we give you thanks. And Lord, it all emanated from you. It's all of you. It's all of grace. And we marvel that we're even allowed to look into the work, let alone suit up for the race, let alone be announced already that we've run the race and won it by your grace. Help us, Lord, this year to drop 
not only that weight and that encumbrance, but to drop to our knees and say, O oh Lord, it's been the look that saved me, but Lord, it's the gaze that will satisfy me. This year, I'll look to you, sustaining that awesome worship and praise and living a holy life. Lord, we're not asking this because it's impossible. We're asking it and accepting it because it's required. Because they did it before. You did it as our example. And it's now our responsibility to be equally as accountable and to serve you with all of our hearts and lives. Help us. As we're bowed in prayer, will you, will you drop that uh, weight? It's not a sacrifice. Don't think you're giving up anything that you'd love to keep. It's ruining your chances. You need to just drop it. Dump it. Take your hands off it. What you may need to drop is your hands on your life. You're going to do this, and you're going to do that, and this is what you're going to decide, and... You're doing everything and you're going nowhere. Maybe you need to drop the hold of your life and give your life to the Lord. Say, Lord, I can't do it. I'd be foolish to try. Take my life. Let it be consecrated to you. You're my sponsor. You're my fuel. Your name's on my uniform. You set the course. You know the game. I'll just run. Whatever it is. We're not going to probe this morning too long. But I wonder how many, just with a hand sign, a hand sign. The Bible says lifting up holy hands. Just with a hand sign, one hand. I wonder throughout this wonderful, wonderful fellowship this morning, how many would say, without identifying it, that's between you and the Lord. Each of us runs our own race. I'm going to drop it. I'm going to give it up. I'm going to release it. I'm going to run the race this year, and I'm going to look unto Jesus and say goodbye to that sin that lessens my chance to be effective for Jesus. I'm going to do that. I'm going to lay it down. Here's my hand, Ross. I do that today. All over the room, how many would do that? Before the Lord. This is for the Lord. For the Lord, I do it. Many of you didn't do that. Many of you didn't raise your hands. That means maybe you're not ready to, you don't care about it, you're indifferent to it, you don't know what it is, or you just are going to prolong your chance of changing. Don't do it. We'll not ask for other hands, but you need to think about the consequence of not running the way the Lord has asked you and commanded you to. You're not paying attention to your coach. He's a specialist. You're ignoring it. Now, you understand the consequence. You're going to pay. He's paid it all. You're going to pay. Don't choose to lose. Determine to win. It's in your will. It has nothing to do with circumstances. It's whether you will do it. If you will, do it now. Even though you didn't raise your hand, do it now. Let the Lord be your guide this year. Dan, just go uh, to uh, take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. Let's just sing that song as, as we go. Take the name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe. It's a great gospel song, precious name, oh how sweet. Hope of earth and joy of heaven. It's a great chorus. Just wait one more minute before you slip out. And at the end of our service, look unto Jesus and repeat this beautiful song in his wonderful name. All right? Let's sing.